The C-SPAN networks bring you long-form public affairs programming from the nation's capital and are a public service of your television provider. C-SPAN, created by cable. Then we can't have a commander-in-chief who suggests that it's okay to torture people. That suggests that we should ban entire religions from our country. We can't afford a commander-in-chief who insults POWs. Or attacks... No, wait, 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 wait. Hold up, hold up, hold up. Hold up, hold up. Hey, hold up, hold up. Hold up, we're talking. Hey! Hold up! Hold up! Hold up! Hold up, hold up, hold up! Hey, listen, 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 listen. Listen up. Hey, I told you to be focused, and you're not focused right now. Listen to what I'm saying. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Hold up. Everybody sit down and be quiet for a second. Everybody sit down and be quiet for a second. Now listen up. I'm serious. Listen up. You've got an older gentleman who is supporting his candidate. He, he's not doing nothing. You don't have to worry about him. You should. This is what I mean about folks not being focused. First of all, first of all, we let, for, hold up. Hold up. First of all, we live in a country that respects free speech. So, second of all, it looks like maybe he might have served in our military and we got to respect that. Third of all, he was elderly and we got to respect our elders. And fourth of all, don't boo. Boo! Don't boo. Boo! Come on! I want you to pay attention. Because if we don't, if we lose focus, we could have problems. This is part of what's happened here during this election season. We just get stirred up for all kinds of reasons that are unnecessary. Just relax. Now, I want to remind you what I was saying. We can't afford a commander-in-chief who insults POWs, who attacks a Gold Star mother, who actually talks down to our troops, says he knows more than our generals. Even a Republican senator said we can't afford to give somebody like that the nuclear code, somebody so erratic. I want you to think about that. It's probably a bad subject because I really don't know what the deal is with the Iran deal. All I know about all I know about an Iran nuclear deal is they've been a year from getting they've been year, a year away from getting the bomb for about a decade. So I'm not sure how scared I should or shouldn't be. I don't know if you have a better it view just, on um, that. Yeah, I mean it, it's it carries out there telling people that that this deal, you know, with uh, we're going to free up all this all this money and and stop. The sh- sanctions regime uh, that we've had, uh, 
and we're going to have this this system of inspections that that where basically they they get three weeks notice before anything happens. This is this is they would have gotten a bomb if it not, were it not for this deal. But now that this deal is in place, they're they're definitely not going to get one. But 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 boy, uh, uh, don't we don't we kind of support the Iran deal for uh, the wrong reasons? Well, yeah, I mean, here's my thing with the I mean, yeah. deal. My general take on it is I, I don't really care about it, but the way that the administration and the media and the left is is selling this as as a good deal for the stated objective is pretty offensive because it's completely fucking retarded. I mean, you're going to have an ins- you you're going to have an inspection and you give them 3 weeks notice. You can move anything in the fucking world in 3 weeks. <laughs> you could move an entire nuclear bomb in three weeks, Goy. But no, I, I like it because you know a, a certain small nation with a white and blue flag is, seems to be very upset about it. And as long as they're upset, if someone if someone's kvetching, then you know I'm I'm all for it. Sign the deal. Sign it now. I don't care. Yeah, but, you know whatever. People are kvetching except for the the fucking Jew Democrat apparatchiks in this country. I see. Uh, I see oh, Lemis, really? yeah, Lemis, yeah, yeah, Lemis is merchant. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 she no, gave no. she gave her she gave her support to it today. I saw that. Did yeah, she, oh. she, she she choked up while she was announcing her support of the Iran deal. <laughs> so, she, what, she, so she went against her Jewish heart on this. It, yeah, she put the magic Negro's legacy uh, even even ahead of the safety of the mm, tribe. That's interesting. Wow. That's very interesting. This could work out well. Who knows? Yeah, the uh, and and you guys have talked about this on the show. Uh, the the you know the the seventy eight percent of Jews in America who support the Democratic Party and they're right. very secular and a lot of the you know the. They just they don't really give a fuck about Israel, especially, you know, they see them like doing all these right wing things and having. uh... I don't know. They have this. The cognitive dissonance is real, bro. It's like, you know, they vote Democrat. They're very liberal. But when, you know, whose side are they taking the Palestinian conflicts? They're not really they're not really protesting. That's usually the that's the goy. That's the goy liberals that are uh, angry with Israel about the. uh, Yeah. The Pal- and the, the the divest from Israel movement. That's not a Jewish movement, I don't think. I could I suppose I could be wrong, but that would go against any sort of No, they they, they don't like uh BDS. <laughs> BDS is that like a new kind of porn? What is that? Uh yeah, that's what it's called. BDSM? It's called, yeah, the the boycott uh, <laughs> divestiture and sanction. Oh, for divest- some of the diseases I have, like I said, they don't know what they are. <laughs> could be a, a standard divestment party. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really don't know, man. They're uh, they're they they'll fucking they'll keep you guessing, as always. Well, weren't you saying uh, like a week or two ago, Halberstram, that it would probably be bad if if uh, Israel got bombed by Iran because then we would have to accept all of their fucking refugees. Oh my God! Yeah, the, you you think you think they're they're laying it on thick about Syrian refugees, dude? Imagine if a fucking uh, you know a, a fucking a million Jews needed to come to this country that they would. Well, they would... hope. I mean, if if we can count if we can count on count on Iran to do things right, hopefully there wouldn't be any refugees, right? <laughs> 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 but I, I, wonder, I wonder, like, what, can you imagine the American response? I mean, it wouldn't just be taken on refugees. Oh, my God, would we have to... I mean, we'd be right back over there again in full force. God knows how many fucking troops we would have to... I mean, it would just be... Oh, it would be a disaster in that respect because of the... Uh, un- unless... I, I don't I don't see... I wish it would happen, but I don't see, like, okay, I, Iran drops their new bomb on Israel, and we just go, oh, well... Oh, Washington. Oh, well, I guess yeah. we screwed that up. Let's just uh, move on with our life. No, we'll be over there with like the, yeah. you know, every just say every... nothing of the of the sixty five nukes that Israel has or whatever. Or yeah, whatever we'll, there are. We'll, we'll be over every every as you said, every Jew in the media will be kvetching, and we'll, we'll have to send our you know our entire fucking armed services over there to. Uh, yeah, it, it's reprisal. something fun to LARP about, but I don't think at the end yeah. of the day it would be a positive development. Yeah, I would, yeah, it wouldn't work out too well. Yeah. 
those few moments as the doors of the Air Force One prepared to usher out Barack Obama for his visit to Kenya, this time as a sitting U.S. president. Those few moments of anticipation. Would he embrace the homecoming spirit that awaited outside? From the quick gallops down the steps to the humble photo op with the little flower girl and on to the stretch of handshakes with President Uhuru Kenyatta's lineup, Obama maintained his presidential poise never losing grip of the power that his title drags along. But as he got to the tail end and into the arms of his sister, Dr. Auma Obama, it all became clear. This visit was more than just business. The journey of finding his identity by sifting through the dynamics of his family has been a big part of Obama's life. The romance between Barack Obama's parents grew during their studies at the University of Hawaii. Two years after his birth in 1961, Barack Obama's father, Barack Obama Sr., left his young family to pursue further studies at Harvard University. At 10 years old, his stepfather, who had now adopted him, shipped him and his mother to his country, Indonesia, where he had secured a job. And then in his teens, Obama was sent back to Hawaii to live with his maternal grandparents, both of whom were Caucasian. Although this multiplicity of cultures gave a young Barack an outlook of the world, it soon grew into the basis of a rigorous quest for self-awareness. In this recently released archive speech that he gave at the Cambridge Library in 1995, shortly after releasing his book, Dreams from My Father, that internal conflict is crystal. Much of my life was spent trying to reconcile the terms of my birth, uh, that divided heritage, with the realities of race and nationality, uh, tribal identities uh, that exist not just in this country but also overseas. Uh, so that this book is not so much a memoir, I think, is, is sort of a, a journey of discovery for me, some sense of trying to make sense of my family. And, and family is always a complicated thing, but it's, it was a little bit more complicated for me. But even though his biological father broke ties with him at the toddler stage, Barack's visit back to Kenya to explore his paternal roots in 1988 changed his outlook on identity, politics, and family. And finally, he says, he realized why his two parents ended up marrying. Part of the impulse for my parents marrying each other, you've got a, a white woman from a, a lower middle class background in, in a small starched you know, uh, town in, in Kansas. Now she marries an African. Well, something's going on there. I mean, part of what's going on, and she's you know, the, the, the most wonderful woman I know. And, and Part of what was going on with her was she's trying to break out of the isolation and stultification and, and uh, constraints of her upbringing. My father, on the other hand, he's trying to break out of his own sense of isolation. He is a transitional figure, someone who's moving essentially from the 18th century directly into the 21st out of a small Kenyan village into you know, a Harvard PhD program uh, you know, in one fell swoop. Nearly 30 years after meeting his father's side of the family, Obama has remained closest to his sister, Auma, and his grandma, Mama Sarah Obama. Right after landing in Kenya, President Barack Obama went straight to dine with his family, grandma to the right and Auma to his left. But it's not hard to understand why Auma could be so easily his favorite. He wrote fondly about her in his first memoir, describing how she carried him in her beetle the first time he arrived in Kenya. <laughs> so while he'll carry the image of his office throughout this trip to Kenya and Ethiopia, the little intimate moments that President Obama shares with his family will remain significant to his personal journey. Ashamwilu, KTN News.
Assalamu alaikum. Many other Americans have Muslims in their families or have lived in a Muslim majority country. I know because I am one of them. But my father came from a Kenyan family that includes generations of Muslims. As a boy, I spent several years in Indonesia and heard the call of the Azan at the break of dawn. Well, I have known Islam on three continents before coming to the region where it was first revealed. That experience guides my conviction. You, you are absolutely right that John McCain has not uh, talked about my Muslim faith. As the Holy Quran tells us, the Holy Quran teaches that, the Holy Quran tells us, and the Holy Quran also says, we will convey our deep appreciation for the Islamic faith, which has done so much over the centuries to shape the world. I would like to speak directly to the people and leaders of the Islamic Republic of Iran. Your great and celebrated culture. Over many centuries, your art, your music, literature, and innovation have made the world a better and more beautiful place. We know that you are a great civilization, and your accomplishments have earned the respect of the United States and the world. I also know civilization's debt to Islam. It was Islam at places like Uluzar, that carried the light of learning through so many centuries, paving the way for Europe's renaissance and enlightenment. It was innovation in Muslim communities that developed the order of algebra, our magnetic compass and tools of navigation, our mastery of pens and printing, our understanding of how disease spreads and how it can be healed. Islamic culture has given us majestic arches and soaring spires, timeless poetry and cherished music, elegant calligraphy, and places of peaceful comp contemplation. They have fought in our wars, they have served in our government, they have stood for civil rights, they have started businesses, they have taught at our universities, they've excelled in our sports arenas, they've won Nobel Prizes, built our tallest building, and lit the Olympic torch. And when the first Muslim American was recently elected to Congress, he took the oath to defend our Constitution using the same Holy Quran. In ancient times and in our times, Muslim communities have been at the forefront of innovation and education. Islam is not part of the problem in combating violent extremism. It is an important part of promoting peace. The enduring faith of over a billion people is so much bigger than the narrow hatred of a few. In the United States, rules on charitable giving have made it harder for Muslims to fulfill their religious obligation. That's why I'm committed to working with American Muslims to ensure that they can fulfill zakat. It is important for Western countries to avoid impeding Muslim citizens from practicing religion as they see fit. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. We are no longer a Christian nation. We do not consider ourselves a Christian nation. Or the United States has been enriched by Muslim Americans. Since our founding, American Muslims have enriched the United States. Islam has always been a part of America's story. There is a mosque in every state in our union and over 1,200 mosques within our borders. You know, one of the points I want to make is, is that if you actually took the number of Muslims Americans, uh, you know, we'd be one of the mo largest Muslim countries in the world. Let there be no doubt, Islam is a part of America.
He did bow to the Muslim king while he did not do it to the British Queen of England. And by bowing, he showed the world that I am subservient. I do owe, uh, bow down to you as a Muslim king, something no other uh, president has done with Saudi Arabia. The Saudi king is his peer. He is not his subordinate in order to bow for him. And this is exactly what Obama did. Usually it is out of respect that someone would nod his head when bowing to royalty and the ladies will give curtsy. But Obama went beyond what is required as a head of state and bowed to the Saudi king, and that's unacceptable. Right, why, it sent the wrong symbol. What, when you say it's saying it sends the wrong signal, what signal do you think it sends? It sent a message that Islam is superior to any other, other master or king or president in the world. That an American president bound to a Muslim king. It also sent a message that terrorism and jihadism is giving Islam the respect it, it should have on the world stage to the point that it made an American president for the first time in history bow to a Muslim king. Presidential candidate Barack Obama is trying to change political fashion. He gave a speech in Iowa City today, and he wasn't wearing an American flag pin. Those pins have become synonymous with politicians since 9-11. Obama says he doesn't like how the pin has come to represent patriotism in America. Uh, I won't wear that uh, pin on my chest. It's a little weird, Alan, that in the middle of the campaign, the guy takes off the American flag <laughs> that most people wear because they're proud of their country. Let me speak as clearly and as plainly as I can. America is not and never will be at war with Islam. Thank you. And Ed Shomar Mubarak.